Hello friends, I am Dr. Mahesh Kalra, Director of Center for Numismatics uh, Information and Studies, Mumbai. And I am here today to speak about the subject of origin of Indian coinage and the rest of the world under the topic of numismatics. So we are going to basically look at a variety of uh, coins and money forms that first developed in India and world across just to give the people who are looking at the objects, uh, at coins, at information of how did coinage come about um, in, across the world. Uh, today money comes in the form of uh, various objects like coins, banknotes, valuable metals, uh, fixed deposits, credit cards, debit cards, DMAT accounts. Uh, today it's become an important tool for the functioning of modern human society and we all understand how lack of money can lead to chaotic violent transactions. Uh, but this was not the case in the case of uh, prehistoric or undeveloped societies as in that period money did not come as an immediate object, uh, it was not a natural product, instead it came through painful indirect experiments coupled with a lot of human ingenuity. Um, how do we think that human ingenuity was involved? It was because at various periods of human history, we look at various objects which functioned as money, not only coins, there were a lot of objects which were earlier termed as barter objects, but today we term them as money objects simply because now the function is better understood that they actually function as money. So the earliest form of money was probably stone tools. Yes, stone tools which were possibly weapons or um, objects with which uh, animals were hunted down function as money. Small curios like cowries metal nails and sundry household objects collectively which have been today termed as money objects were exchanged between groups of men and women in the early prehistoric period. So some of the prehistoric objects that we have shown in the slide you can see are cowrie shells. Some of them are figures of gods and goddesses that are the figurines and then there are obvious objects uh, which were like um, beads. Uh, beads again were specialized objects which were made by uh, people. So people who had this technology had an advantage over the others and this led to the concept of uh, them being money. Uh, if we look at money, how do we define money? Money can be anything which can be used as a medium to exchange goods of different values on a day-to-day -day basis and serve as a store of future value uh, for future purposes. Uh, this we can explain in a, a modern period very easily but if you look at the past it becomes a very difficult thing hence we will be looking at various money objects from this definition and its angle also look at ideal units of money which I have shown in the slide uh, which have certain qualities like easy div divisibility into smaller units for small transactions easiness uh, of transport from one place to another and finally, long lasting for storage value for future purpose. Now, if we look at the concept of money, we have to look at the history of Indian civilization itself. And as we all know, Indian civilization developed into in four major epochs. The first was the prehistoric period, which began about 1.5 million years ago and lasted up till 800 BC when there was the Neolithic period. Uh, if we look at this period, we, this is where we are going to see primitive money objects. Then there is the Harappan period uh, whose major uh, mature phase was between 3500 BC and 1900 BC. Also it is called as the first urbanization of India. We will be looking at its uh, money, uh, possible uh, forms of money in that period. Then we are looking at the Vedic period which lasted from 1500 BC to up till 900 BC. We are going to look at the primitive form of money where the cow was regarded as the major form of money and then there was slow gradual shift towards uh, uh, pure metals. And finally we are looking at the Mahajanpad period or the pre-Buddhist period when the second urbanization took place in the Gangetic uh, belt of India. This lasted from the 8th century BC to up till 6th century BC. 
So the prehistoric period, as I have already explained, uh, ha lasted much before in Indian history, uh, beginning somewhere around 1.5 million years ago. And based on the various tools, technologies that develop over the phase, uh, various phases, they have been divided into lower Paleolithic, middle Paleolithic, upper Paleolithic periods, finally up to Mesolithic period where we find small sharp tools called microliths and the slow beginnings towards a settled life. So we, at the prehistoric period, what we are looking for is a gradual sign of development of a technology which keeps improving as the time passes and that leads to us understanding that people are slowly moving towards a more settled life. When we come to the Neolithic period, we find the earliest beginnings of agriculture and domestications of animals. Also, we find a very important change in this period that is the beginning of uh, pottery. And with the pottery comes the development of storage of surplus, which leads to the concept of money in a better fashion. In this period, we also find primitive housing uh, in uh, very primitive structures called wattle and dog structures. But very important is the development of pottery. So we can divide Neolithic period into two periods, a ceramic and ceramic, that is with or without pottery. Um, one of the examples we I already illustrated was the stone tools. Many times we come across stone tools which have collectively been uh, stored at a place like this place called Hereguda in uh, Sangankalu district of uh, Karnataka where we find a number of stone tools gathered together and this has been termed as a stone tools factory. We find similar developments even in the Harappan period like one place in Gujarat called Bagasra where uh, collectively a lot of shell bangles remains have been found and this can be termed as a tool factory for a specific object that is shell bangles. Uh, in the case of Harappans, we also find a lot of objects which could have functioned as money. So the modern period, uh, as we look at today, we start developing the concept that each object can be possibly functioning as money, not only as a barter object. So we see variety of pots, we see variety of objects which can be used for playing. So when we look at Harappan period, we see a variety of objects which can function as money objects. Chief among these are objects like pots, of course. Then there are uh, actual figure, figurines of gods and goddesses. We also find a variety of shells, shell bangles. We also find uh, fine, uh, finely made uh, uh, beads, which were a function, which were a speciality of certain regions in Gujarat. We also find toys of various nature. And as we all know, many of these objects were imported abroad by the Harappans simply because they were produced in India and not elsewhere. So this is the basic idea of Harappan money that is functioning, creating an object of function which becomes then an object of value and thus it becomes a kind of money. Now we look at uh, the wider period of Vedic era. This has been uh, believed to be uh, lasting from 1500 BC, it could have been earlier as well. As we know, post Harappan period dragged on from 1900 BC till we came into historical consciousness. And in the early Vedic period, uh, there are literature which are full of references to cow as a form of wealth. Uh, first is the numerous terms like Gopal, Gopuch, and others like uh, references to the daughter as Duhitri, one who milks the cow. So this gives us an idea how important the cow was to the Vedic people. Uh, we see similar references in other foreign civilizations to uh, cattle as form of wealth. This is seen in both Greek and Roman societies in the bronze period. And uh, we see cattle herding becoming a very important kind of monetary wealth in the African societies of the early modern period. Cattle raiding was also the cause for early wars as one story in the Rig Veda, the battle of 10 kings tells us that is an actual battle for territory and cattle. So in the Vedic period we see a variety of references to slow changes that is in the later Vedic period to actual introduction of metal as a form of money 
there are various references to Hiranya and Hiranya Pinda, which were small amounts of gold and silver weighed for exchange. Initially, both the metals were termed as Hiranya, but later differentiation uh, happened between the two metals, that is two names, Suvarna or Pitta for gold and Rajat for silver. We also see across the world a number of uh, hoards of bullion, uncoined bullion which has been found, pointing to a pre-coinage form of uh, use of bullion as wealth. This is not only seen in uh, the West, it is also seen in India. One of the uh, images on the right that we see here is a gold hoard which was found from a site called Mandi uh, near Haryana and it is believed to have been an Harappan site. Similarly, one of the hoards of metal that I have shown in the slide is basically traced from Egypt in the 14th century BC. So we see a lot of hoarding of gold and silver simply as a form of wealth in both uh, Harappan and non-Harappan societies across the world. The Vedas themselves speak of variety of uncoined metallions like Nishka, Suvarna, Shatamana, Pana, Pada and Chakra, Chandra. We also find a lot of uncoined ingots of precious metal in India itself. Now these metals can range from copper to gold which have been stored as hoards. One of the terms uh, for copper hoards which have been found across in UP is the copper hoard culture or the ochre colored pottery, OCP culture as it is termed, dated to about 1500 BC. Here we find lots of copper objects uh, which almost look like swords along with anthropomorphic objects which look like human figures. Uh, so this tells us that these were also considered as forms of wealth in that period. So this gives us the idea that the initial metal was seen as a form of money and all that was required to make a coin out of it was basically to give it a stamp. Now this itself, this development itself took about another uh, 600 years for humans to develop and the earliest coinages thus are dated to about 700 BC. This brings us to the idea or the question what is a coin? So a coin is nothing but a piece of metal of prescribed weight and metallic content with a stamp of official authority guaranteeing its content and use as money. Since coins were ingeniously um, invented across the world of early historic period, we term various of these uh, developments as coinage traditions. And this has been for, this term has been first used by Joe Cripp in about 2004. Um, prior to him, there has been also other references to coinage traditions. So coinage traditions can be largely divided into Western and Eastern traditions. And these are then further divided into three subtypes. Western tradition, Indian tradition and the Chinese tradition. We are now going to first look at the Western tradition which began in the area of Mediterranean world and then spread to across the world even going to the Persian world. So the coinage traditions of the ancient world if we see began with the Lydian dinar and this is dated to about 6th century BC. From there it spread to the Mediterranean world. From Mediterranean world it spread to the city states of Greece and finally it went to the imperial Greece in about 4th century BC. Also it spread to the uh, Persian speaking world under the Achaemenids in about 5th century BC and from there it spread to the Parthian period and from Parthian period it came to India. We also see the Indian tradition which began about the same period though we can't exactly date it but many of the experts have dated this tradition to about 6th century BC. Others have been skeptical about the date and have termed it as 4th century BC. But nevertheless, this was a very unique tradition which has been termed as Indian tradition which we will be discussing in detail later. And then there is the Chinese tradition which is believed to be rice based and based on silver and certain other objects. So the first is the western coinage tradition. It connects earlier to the earlier period of Mesopotamian civilization itself where weighed silver pieces were known and the traditional records as well as historical records confirmed by the recovery of silver hoards from various Sumerian sites. The western usage of silver thus went back to 3000 years before Christ 
both as uh, used as monetary unit and there were terms used as shekel and mina. Uh, shekel was a coin or a uncoined uh, silver which weighed about 8.4 grams and mina were weighed about half kg. And this is mentioned in many legal texts like the Ishuna Code and the Code of Hammurabi. Here we are showing the Code of Hammurabi's steel where various inscriptions show us uh, terms related to uncoined silver. The first proto-coinage in the world possibly came in the region of Black Sea in the form of bronze arrow-shaped objects and around 600 BC there were also objects which were shaped like dolphins. As we know, it came from a region called Olbia which is on the northern shore of the Black Sea and these have been dated as about 5th to 6th century BC without inscriptions initially and later there are inscriptions on these as well. But the earliest coinage which came in the world came to know came from a region called Lydia. Lydia is nothing but modern Turkey and it is here that the earliest coinage was made uh, recorded by a historian called Herodotus which we all know he was the first uh, Greek to write the history of the world as it was known. The term history itself comes from his book Historia written about 464 BC. So here uh, there's a reference to a coinage which was made from an electron which was a natural alloy of gold and silver and these coins were issued in about 6th century BC. If we look at the slides we'll see that Lydia exactly fell before, between Asia and Europe and it was at a big advantage that they had that they could actually uh, charge a lot of traders who went from Europe to Asia and vice versa. So the people of uh, Lydia started issuing these small coins based on the idea that they would be collected back as toll and go back to the treasury. Uh, the earliest coins does have an imprint of a lion or a lion attacking a goat um, and the reverse of these coins are usually blank. So the first coins as we know were made by these people because Herodotus says so. Also Lydian currency benefited from natural mines of electrum which occurred in the region in the Pactolus river. In fact there was a myth about Midas putting his hand in the river Pactolus and the whole ground converting itself into gold. And this gave the king Croesus a very important status. In the Middle English there was a term as rich as Croesus. And this came basically from the connection of Lydia uh, King Croesus being very rich simply because he made the coins that he again got back. So the Greek uh, tradition, the Greeks were then inspired uh, to make similar coins to Lydia and also the Achaemenids who independently adapted this technique to the Persian regions of ancient period. So the, another thing that came to the Greek world around this period was the weight paradigm. As we all know the Greek uh, coinage is weighed in uh, or measured in a unit called dram. The dram is nothing but uh, basically connected to a story of the Greek islands where there was a ruler called King Phidon who ruled over a place called Argus and he basically developed a conversion unit between what was the earlier currency that is iron rods called iron spits uh, basically used to grill uh, a lot of meat uh, the conversion rate between that and silver. According to this formula, 4.37 grams of silver could measure up to 6 iron rods uh, which basically were, were held by a Greek man. So this led to the concept of dram which actually means being held in a palm. So according to this formula, 4.37 grams made one dram and this became the coin later. Uh, similarly, one iron spit was about 0.72 grams of silver. This gave rise to the coin called oblos because the Greek word for iron spit was obelus. And this slowly developed into what was then termed as the Attic weight system developing in the uh, uh, area called Attica. Similarly, there were other concepts of weight. One was the Aegean diagram, uh, which was basically 12.2 grams and another was Corinthian stator 
weighing about 8.1 grams. The Corinthian stator was also used later by the Romans basically to weigh their gold coins. Uh, similarly, uh, there was the spread of this coinage as I said, uh, basically from the two traditions of Lydia and uh, the drum unit and this slowly was adopted by Philip II, a Macedonian ruler and father of Alexander the Great who termed the ATX standard as the main weight standard for the entire Greek speaking world in about 300 BC. So here we see in the slide a lot of coins which look like the Lydian dinar. On the obverse you see a kind of a figure uh, like this coin of Ephesus which was issued about 620 BC where you see a, a figure of a stag and on the reverse you see a kind of a clueless square in cues. So this was very very similar to the earlier Lydian dinars and slowly as we see the slide uh, going from the left to right we see the change in the reverse where slowly the square becomes a kind of a meaningful development till at the end in about 404 BC in a place called Aegina we see the word Aegina written in Greek as AIG which means of the Aegean people. So we, as we see the earliest coins in the world were one sided or what we term as unifaced and it was only later that the concept came up of issuing coins with two sides having some kind of um, expression on the other side as well. So the classical period of uh, Greeks we see a bifaced or two sided coin and this is a period which was much later uh, about 400 BC uh, lasting up till 2, 323 BC when Alexander uh, the Great's coin came about. In this period we see a largely concept where on one side you see the image of a god or goddess and on the other side there are other impressions many times uh, you know kind of totem deities of the cities like we see this coin of Athena where we see the on the obverse the image of goddess Athena and on the reverse we see an owl and owl was considered as a symbol of uh, goddess Aegina herself. So this was coin was basically issued in large numbers in this period. The other coin which was a very large number issued in large numbers was the coins of Alexander the Great. So at the end of uh, uh, the Hellenic period or classical period we find that the Greeks are very confident of making a very a uh, nicely struck coin on both sides and on one side they very clear that they could be a legendary deity or it could be a hero whose image would be put on one side and on the reverse there would be another god or goddess along with an inscription. So this was the Greek idea which developed in the early centuries of the before the Christ in and about 300 BC in the Greek speaking world. So the most uh, famous coins of the period of the classical uh, period of the Greeks was uh, the Athenian owl. These were coins which were impressed on one side, uh, the image of goddess Athena who was the patron goddess of the city of Athens and on the other side we see the image of an owl and if you look at very closely at this slide you would see that the image of the owl is very well uh, designed and executed on the coin itself. So this tells you that at about this period the Greeks were very very uh, well skilled in this technology of die striking coins and you can see fine features of the uh, god or goddess or any figure on the coin and this period ended with a large mintage of a coin called as the Alexandrian tetradram. As we all know Alexander conquered most of the known world including uh, the uh, conquest of Persia and this led to the release of huge amount of uncoined bullion which lay in the treasury of the Persians and this was used as a payment to the Greek army which came and went with Alexander. So this led to the coining of this coin known as the Alexandrian tetradrum. and Alexandrian tetradrum again have a great mythology connected to it. On one side of it we see the image of um, the Greek hero Hercules and we see the image of Hercules with a lion skin on his head. So this is one of the very popular Greek myths where 
uh, Hercules actually kills the lion and on the other side we see the image of God Zeus along with an eagle and on this again we see the inscription Alexander in Greek. So this is the achievement of the Hellenic period where you start making a coin uh, with exact human figures as lifelike as possible with finely uh, features of the lifelike looking images of the king or queen whose image is being portrayed on one side and the other side there are largely legendary or uh, godlike figures with inscriptions in the name of the ruler. So this in large was the Greek tradition at the end of the classical period. By this time we come to also the period of the Persians, the Achaemenids, the great Achaemenids who ruled and created the largest empire in the Persian speaking world and here came about a coinage called as the gold coinage called Darek, named after the greatest Achaemenid ruler Darius the first and this again weighed about 8.6 grams corresponding somewhere to the shekel weight and it had its silver units called as Siglos and there was an inter-conversion inter unit, uh, inter-conversion possibility rate between the Dareks and the uh, Siglos. One Darek was equal to 20 Siglos. So uh, this was the achievement of the Achaemenids in their period and later as we all know there was a great coinage called the Parthian coinage but the Parthian coinage was largely inspired by the Greek paradigm rather than this tradition of the uh, Persians. The Dareks continued in circulation till the end of the Achaemenid Empire uh, which happened in 330 BC with the invasion of Alexander and the sack of the capital Persepolis. Now we come to the tradition of the Chinese and the Chinese I believe that their tradition goes back to the 14th century BC uh, to the period of the Shang dynasty and the earliest concept of uh, money at this period was the use of shauri, cowries in strings and these strings are named as peng and also along with these uh, actual cowries there were imitations of cowries made from bone, stone and bronze. In the later period bronze cowries became very very popular as a medium of money. So we find the late Shang period and the Eastern Zhao period which is about 770 BC uh, there is an increasing trend towards the use of bronze cowries instead of the actual cowries and we find them as a large numbers as grave goods in excavations. The next or the other form of currency which developed in the late Shang period was the utensil money. Now in this concept there were primitive forms of spades and knives termed as Pu and Tao in different sizes and shapes which develop in the different parts of the Chinese kingdom. Uh, small utensils were also uh, you know interrelated to the actual utensils. The actual utensils forming the highest denomination followed by these lower functional non-functional copies which were to be exchanged against them. The tools were also used uh, for grave goods and payment into the treasury. There was also exchange rates with cowries as some of these Spades has an inscription uh, with the term Peng which means a double string of cowries and Shan or sometimes numerals which have been inscribed on these small spades. Uh, this primitive vessel money was then later uh, practically abolished or demonetized in the period of the first emperor Shi Huangti of the Qin dynasty who unified the entire China and built the Great Wall. He replaced these uh, uh, primitive money forms with round bronze coins with a square hole at the center. These coins are marked by a two character inscription and are known as Ban Liang, literally half an ounce in weight and survived uh, as the main currency of China under different names. So at various periods various terms were used but basically the form of money was same at some periods it was called as Wuzu, it was called also as Kai Yuan, Tong Bao and finally Cash by the Portuguese. The unique shape of the coin was said to be justified in the Chinese belief and ideology that the square shape represented the earth and the heaven was round in shape. Hence the square hole at the center. 
but there was actually a practical reason for the square shape which lay in its manufacturing technique. Uh, technically these coins were made and after uh, through casting technique uh, uh, involving multiple layer molds. If you see the previous slide, you'll see what is termed as the Chinese tree where actually various coins like these are uh, basically united by a common thread of copper leading to the term Chinese tree. So these coins were made with casting in multiple layer folds and after casting them in large numbers, a square rod was passed through uh, the center of the coin basically to smoothen the rough side edges of the outer side. So the square hole helped in stringing the coins together. So even at a later period, you see this is a 20th century image which shows a number of coins being strung together in form of large number of coins together and these coins basically were used from 250 BC to up till the period of Republic of China um, in 1911. The first coin issued by the Republic of China was a traditional cash coin. Additionally, the Chinese also used a boat shaped uh, silver or gold ingot termed as Sai Si or Yuan Bao right from the Qin period till the period of Qing dynasty which fell in 20th century to the Chinese revolution. Sai Si is nothing but the romanization of Cantonese word which means fine silk and this was probably because of its ability to be drawn into long threads of gold or silver. The Sai Si's were made by local goldsmiths and their value was basically judged by experienced money changers who decided their value and weight in a term called as Tail. Now Tail is again a term which came from Portuguese Tail and that same was then derived from the Indian Tola. And a basic tail was about 37 to 40 grams in weight. So beginning from 40 grams to up till larger uh, weight terms like 10 tails or 100 tails, there were these ingots. And the ingots also had the lower subdivisions in bronze and copper, one of them being mace, which was one tenth of a size. Then there was a candarine, which was one tenth of a mace. And finally, the common cash, which was one tenth of a candarine. So this was the concept of Chinese money. Now we come to the concept of Indian coinages. How did they come about? And as I have already explained, these are the high, earliest date can, that can be attributed to Indian coinage is 700 BC or there can be a date of 400 BC which has been used later. Now the earliest references to coins being stamped comes in the pre-Buddhist period and then these are related as Buddhist Jatak tales and the Buddhist Jatak tales speak of coins termed as Karshapanas or Kahapanas in Pali and the subunits called Pana, Mashak or Kakmis. The Kahapanas are said to be existing or coexisting with a higher currency unit termed as a Shatman. Now one coin that we are seeing on the slide is the on the left side. This is the Mauryan Karshapana and it weighs about uh, 32 rati seeds. Rati was nothing but a small seed which had a fixed weight of 0.11 grams and it was preferred as the unit, basic unit of coins in India right from this period. Um, so the Mauryan coin was about 32 rati seeds and the coin on the right was a coin which weighed about 30, 100 ratis uh, and that we believe is the Shatamana referred to in the various literal resources. The Shatamanas were found in uh, the region of Gandhar and today they have been termed as the coinage, official coinage of Gandhar Janpad simply because these coins are found in the region of Kabul in uh, Afghan and Pakistan border. Uh, Arthashastra speaks of uh, coins being in multiples of the Rati as I have already explained and the Karshapana of the Mauryans was nothing but 32 Ratis. This comes to about 3.3 grams. So the modern coins which have been recovered of the period of Mauryans weigh about 3.2 grams uh, accordingly. Uh, so who were the first people to issue these coins? Uh, they were nothing but the early Iron Age kingdoms termed as the Mahajanpadas. 
and these have been uh, mapped according to old texts, uh, both Buddhist as well as Mahabharat uh, and other epics have been used, but largely a text uh, of the Buddhist period has been used, which refers to 16 or Sola Saj Mahajanapadas. The earliest coinage in India was issued by smaller independent states in a period of 6th century BC. Uh, these have been termed as the Mahajanapadas and there are references to 16 such states. Modern numismatists have used this information uh, to basically plot out the coins according to the finding of the coins in the modern period as coin hoards. So this is uh, the modern classification of the Janapada, the local punchmark series. We find various coins classified accordingly. And there's one series in particular which is found exclusively in uh, the south of India in the period in the area called Y region and this is believed to be one of the earliest coinage issued from South India in various uh, weight terms ranging from a half Shatman to about one fourth Shatman. Now we come to the period of the Imperial Maha, Maha Magad Janapada. This coinage is believed to be issued by the uh, rulers of Magad when they assumed the imperial powers both under the Nandas and the Mauryas but largely in the period of Ashoka we see these coins uh, which have five punch marks that is five symbols found all over India. So this is believed to be largely the coinage uh, India issued under a unified power in the 4th century BC and these uh, are largely the coins as we can see in this period weighing about 32 ratis and corresponding to the Magadhan Karshapana. So the Panchmark coinage is believed to have uh, circulated for about 500 years and the, hence it can be termed as the earliest coinage tradition of India and becoming the main coinage which was largely different from the western tradition uh, which basically inspired and guided the later coins of India uh, that is the Greco-Roman tradition of diastruct coins in the post mauryan period. And also later we find a caste coinage which was experimented in the country. Possibly the connection to the Chinese may have existed in the post modern period. To summarize, we will look at coins basically representing a stage in the monetary history of any culture where pieces of bullion were struck with symbols or designs to authenticate their use as money. Each civilization developed its own coinage tradition through indigenous efforts by the local administration to authenticate the use of bullion as money. Each coinage tradition developed its own paradigm in the form, in the technique and various other parameters uh, which basically emerge from the local traditions of any region. Thus we see three coinage traditions largely in the world. The Western, the Indian and the Chinese traditions emerge in the early historic period of human development of Western and Eastern civilizations. Thank you for watching the video. Uh, do visit EPG Parchala uh, and also see the e-text given for this lecture.